All right. I've got the one and only Dr. Lane Norton. He and I have butted heads in the past. We've since come to agreement on a number of things, still disagree on a number of things, but he is <laughs> no doubt an expert in a lot of the different things we want to talk about today. So the first question I've got is, Lane, what did you have for breakfast, man? Oh, great question. This is actually just going to, for everybody who doesn't like me, this is going to just be like complete uh, validation for you guys. So I actually had Fruit Loops for breakfast with a protein <laughs> shake. <laughs> and that's because I was, uh, I had a big training session this morning. So I needed to get in some, some, uh, some food pretty quickly. And, um, I was also having to take my wife to the airport and I woke up a little bit later than I thought I would be. And so I had about 30 minutes to get up and get going. So it was uh, cereal in a bowl. But on a typical day, it might be like uh, some oatmeal and protein powder, or, um, you know, Greek yogurt and then something else for carbohydrate. But uh, today it was Fruit Loops. And you know what? Fruit Loops, shockingly, actually have three grams of fiber per serving, if you believe it or not. <laughs> so did you mix the protein shake yeah. into the milk or did you have that on the side? Oh, in the milk. Oh, yes. Yeah. As the <laughs> nice. milk, actually. Well, that's, that's perfect. Well, cool, man. I'm going to jump right into stuff because one of the places where you really have made a name for yourself is surrounding the world of just overeating in general. And, you know, in the world of social with Instagram, TikTok, you don't get a chance to really explain and elaborate. And I will say as someone that's kind of been on the other side of some of your viewpoints, you don't get a, you don't get a chance to describe it. And it comes across just direct and it's not necessarily fair because a lot of what you say, I totally agree with when it's fully explained. Uh, so I want to just jump right into this idea of overeating, right? It's overeating in general, no matter what diet you are doing is a problem. And I want to give you a chance to be able to sort of explain this, not necessarily from even a body composition standpoint, not necessarily gaining weight or gaining fat, but just from a nutrient sensing aspect. Can you just give us like a 500 foot aerial view on that? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, if you want to look at acute measures, um, if you overfeed, like you can actually see changes in like insulin sensitivity and, uh, you know, nutrient kind of like spillover in a relatively short period of time. Uh, but I'm always really careful about, you know, how much does short term actually equate to long term. But, um, you know, what's really interesting, like it might be more interesting to discuss kind of the reverse order. So people who are like overweight and obese, you tend to have high like free fatty acids, triacylglycerides, uh, LDL, glucose, even amino acids are elevated in the blood. Um, if you just uh, do like caloric restriction without even much weight loss, uh, very quickly those things start to improve, and 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 much of it is just like you've gone from, you know, getting a lot of these things exogenously to now you're you know kind of turning them over endogenously, and, and that's like the beauty of a deficit is you know what's what's kind of like, for lack of a better term, backed up into the bloodstream has a chance to start clearing out you know, as, as, as you get into a deficit. So, um, you know, overfeeding, I do want to make one caveat because a lot of people have had the struble of, well, I want to gain muscle, but I know overfeeding is bad for me. And I think one of the things to point out is, you know, we have to have nuance to this stuff. And, and one of the problems with a lot of nutrition research is it's really hard to have nuance because people eat in patterns and, you know, finding people like me, which is, you know, overfed for a good portion of life, but on high protein while also resistance training really hard, like good luck finding that cohort. You know what I mean? Like it's very, True. very difficult to find. So I can't say with like, you know, 100% certainty, but I feel very strongly that overfeeding for somebody who is an athlete looking to improve their lean body mass who's resistance training, you know, very, uh, with a lot of intensity and who is in a slight surplus over a long period of time. I think that's quite a bit different than the person who's, you know, very sedentary sitting at home, you know, eating potato chips off the couch. Right. So totally, uh, I think that those, you, you, we have to disentangle those things and just realize like those really aren't the same thing, even though technically both are overfeeding. Right. Um, but I do understand, like, from the perspective, you didn't really touch on this, but I think there were hints of it. 
that the idea of overfeeding or calories in, calories out, or the implication of you are eating too much uh, feels very attacking for people who suffer from obesity, uh, being overweight, because a lot of them don't feel like they're overeating. You know, they, they say, well, I'm, I'm not a glutton. I'm not a sloth. Like, I'm not sitting here shoveling down mounds of pizza. Um, and I, I think for uh, probably a good percentage of people who become overweight or obese, I, I think that's probably the case. I don't think they're just sitting there like guzzling through food. I think a, a lot of it is, you know, when you're used to eating kind of the standard American diet, which is a lot of energy dense foods, you may not feel like you're overeating, but you in fact are in terms of a calorie level because those foods are so energy dense, right? And we see the reverse. People will say, well, you know, people that don't quite get it, they'll say, well, I, I did the keto diet or I did intermittent fasting and I didn't even, I didn't even calorically restrict. Well, you did. You just didn't realize you were doing it because now you're actually eating more nutrient dense foods. You're eating less calorically dense foods and you feel, you actually feel fuller than you did when you were overeating. So your percent and your food volume may actually even be higher than what you were doing previously because these foods are more satiating. So I think that that's a, a little bit of the struggle that some people have connecting those dots. And I want to be really clear when I, I said, when I refer to overeating or I say somebody's consuming too many calories, let's take a financial example because I feel like that's just easier for people. If somebody, if, Thomas, if you're making a million bucks in a year, right? By the way, I don't know Thomas's income, so don't anybody uh, make assumptions off this. But let's say you're making a million bucks in a year and I make $50,000 in a year, right? What blows my budget is going to be completely fine for you, right? Like, and I think that that's really important to point out. Blowing my budget may be perfectly fine for you. And so this is a very individual thing. So when I say, you know, somebody, you know, well, if somebody became obese, it's because they're eating more calories than they, they expended. I'm not saying you're lazy and I'm not saying that you're a sloth or anything like that. I'm just saying for your given level of energy expenditure, which by the way, isn't all in your control. Energy expenditure is not just exercise. We can get into that a little bit more, but for your given level of energy expenditure, you are in fact consuming too many calories, but that doesn't come with judgments behind it. And it's really interesting because I, I saw there was an article that appeared in the Washington Post. I don't know if you saw it by uh, David Ludwig, who's a, a big proponent yeah. of the carb insulin model of obesity. And one of the things they, they, that he said was, well, you know, uh, calories in, calories out model just implies that uh, obesity is the fault of the individual. But the, you know, the carb insulin model doesn't do that. And I'm thinking, how are you saying it's less fault? Because here you're, you're saying you're over consuming calories, but you're saying it's because you're over consuming processed carbs and carbs. How is that any less, how is that any less like, um, you know, of, of like putting personal accountability? Cause it's either personal accountability for consuming too many calories or personal accountability for consuming too many carbs. So I think a lot yep. of the, the kind of verbiage that's been presented to people who are overweight or obese, who are really tired about hearing about how lazy they are, how, you know, uh, it's their fault, which by the way, I don't think it's all someone's fault. Um, but I think that like some of these things that kind of attempt to like kind of relieve that are very attracted to them. So I think that's where a lot of the confusion in connecting these dots is. Now today's video is sponsored by a company called ButcherBox because the protein that you get in should be high quality protein. ButcherBox is a sponsor on this channel. They've been on my channel for five plus years, but they have grass fed, grass finished meat Okay, and they have really good quality poultry, really good quality pork, which is rich in monounsaturated fats and not so much in the saturated fats. They also have sustainable seafood options too. So they have wild caught cod, they have wild caught sockeye salmon, they have wild caught scallops, really cool stuff that is quality focused. So I put that link down below. It gets delivered directly to your doorstep. Super, super easy and convenient. My point in saying this is even if you are trying to reduce protein because you're concerned with the longevity attribute, this is where quality matters. 
So if you're gonna consume less protein, get the good quality protein where you can get micronutrients out of it, where you can get the good fats that you want out of it, and where you get the grass-fed, grass-finished stuff with higher omega-3 content. It does make a difference if you do start reducing protein or you're being cognizant of it. So that link is down below. Again, you go on, you can get my custom boxes, see the kind of stuff that I order as well, and then it gets delivered to your doorstep in a couple of days, super easy. So that link down below. And yeah, I mean, you're right when you say it's not, the individual's fault per se, because things change with what is in our food supply as well as far as how things are combined to be more hyper palatable and combining copious amounts of carbohydrates with copious amounts of saturated fat that maybe weren't even like that 30 years ago. And yes, if you want to get granular, sure, it's the responsibility of the individual to look at the the nutritional facts. But let's face it, like that isn't exactly brought to our attention when we're growing up. It's not in basic curriculum for elementary school to learn how to read a label. So sure, one can take their own account for that. But at the same time, we also look at food that's affordable and things like that and just the natural choices. So sure, you know, you definitely can make that argument that yes, it's someone's fault. They do need to be educating themselves. But really putting yourself in their perspective, really putting yourself in their shoes, sometimes it's hard to make a choice and really understand. And you brought up a really solid point as someone that personally lost a lot of weight with keto. When I lost a lot of weight with keto, there were not a lot of hyper palatable keto foods around. Okay, so I will very much go on record and say that I lost a lot of weight with keto because I was predominantly eating avocados and ground beef. Like I was eating a lot of really wholesome foods. And you see this happen with people that start keto. They start to lose a lot of weight. And there's nuance there, of course, too. Like maybe a dietary shift or a change does something with G-flux, whatever. But I think it's minuscule compared to the fact that once they once they do keto for a while, the cravings do tend to start to come back and they do start to then reach for the more hyperpalatable keto snacks. And those are calorically dense. And it's like clockwork. People do about 90 days of keto, have a lot of success, and then they start going for those things. And I understand needing a little crutch back there, but it's also something very important to note that in the beginning of keto stages for most people, they're like, heck yes, bacon, cheese, I can have. And they do that. And that actually is much more satiating than it is to say, go have, I don't know, some keto, keto bar that's 400 cream. calories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, so and it does come back to the same question. Yeah. Absolutely. And like this is, it's funny because I always like compare the keto community to the the plant based community in that like, hey, there's a there's a a, a great way to do keto that's evidence based, and then there's also a not so good way to do keto, and a lot of it just boils down to like, how much do you buy into the dogma that it's it's not well, I'm not reducing my calories, it's because I'm just keeping insulin low or that sort of thing. So, mm, same thing with plant based stuff. It's how much do you buy into the dogma that all our problems are caused by animal products, right? And so you've got, you know, people in the low carb community will make fun of like, for example, in the game changers when they're like talking about healthy diets, but then they're like having, you know, vegan mac and cheese and vegan chicken wings and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, that's not really great messaging, you know, because you just sat here and said, well, you know, this is what makes a healthy diet. But really what you're implying is it's a healthy diet is just anything that's devoid of animal foods, which is not true. Um, now there's absolutely a healthy way to do a a vegan diet, but it has, you know, it's more about like, okay, well, I'm going to stick to mostly whole foods, minimally processed, you know, you know, very satiating foods. That's, that's the right way to do a plant-based diet. We go to keto, there's a right way to do keto. But then if you like, just as you said, Thomas, if you're, if you're just going out and you're like, well, you know, this keto ice cream is a thousand calories, but that doesn't matter because I'm going to keep my insulin low. And first off, I have serious doubts about whether or not that actually happens. And second off, it's like you're really missing the forest of the trees, you know. And um, Ethan Suplee actually had a great he was he was talking about this. Um, I think it was on I think when I was on his podcast, he talked about this, that, you know, he had gotten kind of like quite a bit of weight off, but then got stuck with keto and he was like, oh, it must be like the vegetables I'm eating or there must be some sugar in the carrots I'm having. He's like, it never occurred to me that it was like the, you know, I just simply in, as my weight had decreased and my calories had started or as I had started to lose a bunch of weight and get these cravings, I'd put more oil on my salad, you know, that I was just dumping like mounds of oil on my salad to make it more palatable. And I didn't realize that like that was actually what was holding me back as opposed to the vegetables I was eating. So 
again, I think that you can have kind of like a real evidence-based keto, like what would you suggested where you're having, you know, lean meats and you're doing uh, avocado or nuts and seeds to a certain extent, because they do have carbohydrate in them. So you can only have so much before you start to rub up against not being in ketogenesis anymore. Um, but then there's also the wrong way to do it, which is, well, I've really missed the messaging and now I'm going to consume a bunch of hyper processed, hyper palatable foods, but they're keto. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. missing the forest through the trees. No, totally, man. And that's, it's a good dovetail into a question that I had. Like, I'm very and genuinely curious because I don't know the answer. Would you say it is worse if you had calorie for calorie, is it worse to overeat carbs or is it worse to overeat fat? Okay. I mean, I have my theories on this because I still think that fats store very easy and carbohydrates have to go through additional steps. And I'm not sitting here condoning everyone goes and overeats a bunch of carbohydrates. I'm just looking at what I see on paper, not being a scientist, being someone that's kind of looking at this. So it's an interesting question. What, what do you think on that? I think it really depends on the source of carbohydrate and fat, to be honest. You know, like um, we'd have, to, it'd be really hard to compare apples to apples, right? Because you've got you know, we do know if you overfeed, and I know we, you were going to talk about this later, but like saturated fat, I mean, calorie per calorie, that seems about to be one of the worst things to overfeed on. Um, if we're looking at like insulin resistance and visceral and visceral fat and those sorts of things, um, that seems to be one of the worst. Um, but, you know, obviously, obviously like overfeeding on sugar compared to, you know, fibrous carbohydrate is, is probably, you know, uh, not so good either. Um, I think... In general, I don't really think there's a big difference because, and here's why, here's why. Um, if you're overfeeding on fat, you're going, so first off, let me back up. We have randomized control trials where they overfeed either carbohydrate or fat and both are equally fattening. So okay. for that, it, it, it doesn't appear to be a big difference. Um, as far as the metabolic implications of that. I haven't really seen a lot of compelling data either way. You can find studies kind of on both sides of the aisle, but a lot of it boils down to what I just said, like what's the specific types of fats they're overfeeding? What's the specific types of carbs they're overfeeding, right? So if I'm comparing overfeeding, say, mono or polyunsaturated fats and omega-3s compared to just overfeeding sucrose, well, the, the fats is probably going to be better. If I'm comparing overfeeding like starchy carbohydrate compared to uh, saturated fat will start your carbohydrates probably going to be better. So I think a lot of it depends on the, the, the specific source. Uh, but overall, in general, I would say that there's probably not a whole lot of difference. Uh, and the reason being that your body's really good at switching between those fuels, right? So if you overeat more carbohydrate, you can't really store it as fat. Uh, your car, the, the amount of carbohydrate that's stored in adipose tissue is like less than 2% of the fat that winds up in adipose tissue originated as carbohydrate. So you kind of were referring to that. Um, so that's great, but that just means that you now have to burn that carbohydrate if you're not storing it as glycogen. And so that's sparing any dietary fat you're eating for storage in adipose, which can cause issues. Well, if you're overfeeding dietary fat and not carbohydrate, well, now you've got more fat and you're going to oxidize more fat, but you're also storing more fat, as you just astutely pointed out, because dietary fat tends to be much more easily stored than carbohydrates. So I think you get to the same place with both. And I think the, the real nuances in the studies come down to like what particular you know source of dietary fat and carbohydrate are they overfeeding? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And especially when you look at, I think even if we remove all of that aside, Perhaps a lot of this is happening at the brain level too, right? It's like just what the hyperpalatability, I keep coming back to that, a combination of saturated fat, which essentially is satisfying a completely separate part of the brain than having a bolus of carbohydrates, right? It's, uh, there's an interesting paper. I can't remember where it was published, but I mean, it was just a couple of months ago. It's very interesting. It was demonstrating that like if someone goes and gorges on fruit, it's essentially pacifying one region of the brain as far as dopamine is concerned. And then if they gorge on fat, it's satisfying a different part. So you're almost getting a double whammy when you're having this massive combination, like you're going to find in something that's complete garbage food. And that's something that perhaps is making us want to eat more. And then that just brings a separate question to mind. It's like, okay, well, we don't really know which one is actually causing the fat storage on you when you eat this bag of Doritos. Is it the 17 grams of carbs that's in it or is it the 14 grams of fat that's in it? You know, we can't break that down and say specifically which one is causing you to gain fat, right? It all depends on your current metabolic state and it all depends on how much the food you're eating, right? 
So I just find that interesting. And actually, I was curious your take on that because we're seeing, you know, I know Andrew Huberman, I know you and Andrew Huberman have gone, you know, head to head on a couple of things, but you also agree on some things. And it's, uh, you guys are both very reasonable people when it comes down to that. He's really big on like the psychological effect of, of food. And like, where do you stand on that? Do you think that's a, a big player today? Uh, I think the psychological effect of food is massive. Um, but I think it's, I maybe have a different perspective on this. I, I think a lot of people get really hung up on the appetite and hunger stuff, which I think is interesting. And by the way, super complex. Like I took uh, a six month um, or a semester on just appetite in grad school. And I walked out going, yeah, we don't know anything. Like it is that complicated, that convoluted. And there's so many, you know, this is one of, kind of one of my arguments with like mechanisms versus outcomes, right? So you can find a lot of different stuff saying, well, you know, carbohydrates are better because they activate this hormone or, or fats are better because they, you know, more grel or less ghrelin and, you know, this is better, this, this is better. And you have to realize that what actually happens at a whole body human level is the summation of all of these different inputs, not just one or two. Right. Like there's you're literally talking about hundreds, thousands of inputs that are all happening simultaneously. And some of it is, like you said, psychological. But one of the things I tell people, uh, honestly, when they get hung up on appetite is I'm like, look, people eat for a lot of different reasons other than just hunger. In fact, I would argue that in today's age, hunger is one of the last reasons people overeat, to be honest. I, I think Fair. there's. I think it's much more compelling for like social cues. Like just think about like when you go out and meet up with friends, you don't just like for the most part, you don't, you're not usually like going out and just like standing around in a park, you know, like you're usually going out and like, Hey, let's get together and get dinner. Let's um, let's have a few drinks, you know, whatever. Like it's, it's a social, you cannot deconstruct the social and societal aspects of food from from our own psychology, right? So there's that. Like you, you mentioned the hyperpalatability of food. Um, trauma, like we know that some people develop, you know, kind of um, not eating disorders necessarily, but use food for a comfort. Um, even like cues, like you're sitting down to watch TV. I mean, they've shown that like just sitting and like reading a book, people don't tend to overeat. But sitting down watching TV, people tend to overeat. It's like we just have some of these like cues where we tend to be like, okay, I should be eating now, right? And I think one of the things like I don't always agree with like intuitive eating just because of the way people promote it sometimes because it's promoted completely irresponsibly by some people. But I think one thing, thing it is useful for is if you can actually use it and if you're truly weight neutral and you don't care what happens to your body weight, just sit and think and go, am I really hungry? Or am I just deciding to eat because it's dinner time? Or am I just deciding to eat because I've got the TV on? Or am I just deciding to eat because I'm hanging around with friends? And think about like, when was the last time you actually truly listened to your body's own internal hunger cues? And I bet for a lot of people, it's not that often. I know I don't really do it. You know, I'm like, yeah. okay, but I'm also kind of a robot because I'm like, all right, these macros and... Um, you know, I usually eat every three to four hours for protein synthesis and, you know, that sort of stuff. So I, I'm not a, a typical human being, but yeah, I think a lot of us are like that where we're, we don't really rely on our internal hunger cues for a lot of stuff. And so one of the, the points I really try to make is like, be careful trying to distill down the obesity problem into, well, this is just people being hungry because I, yeah. I don't necessarily think that's it. Yeah. And even if it was it, it's just so impossible to break down into in each given situation, what is stimulating that hunger. It's you'd be Absolutely. stressing yourself out and then you eat because you're stressed out. So forget it. Yeah. It's, it, okay. I want to jump in. That seems to be divergent as well. Like I know when I'm stressed, I actually don't have an appetite typically. Um, yeah. But a lot of people like they have the differential response. So it's, it's very unique. And I think that that, you know, if I can make one more point on this, I think it's like, if you do this in lab animals, for the most part, you don't see really divergent responses in terms of like what makes a lab animal overeat, right? 
Yeah. You make a food more palatable, they overeat. Um, and with humans, we have such different divergent and honestly, like stress in lab animals tends to just like, they don't eat. Like if you inject them with something that makes them stressed out, like lipopolysaccharide, they just stop eating. Um, so I think that just points to like the fact that a lot of this is like the higher brain stuff and like social or psychological rather than just physiological. But also yeah. we're learning now that social cycle, the biocycle social model is probably much more ac- applicable than we ever realized for darn near everything. Yeah, no, I totally agree on that. And that's, it's why with overfeeding studies in in humans where they, I mean, again, they don't like fully overfeed people, but maybe set amount of food to eat that would be overfeeding. It's almost like, I mean, an ad lib situation is probably much better because it's going to bring all those things into equation a little bit better, right? It's pretty unnatural to say, hey, you're going to overeat X amount, even if they're not hungry, right? Because then how many other things are changing that we are unaware of, right? So it's just, it's completely unpractical to really look at it like that. Um, yeah. And for essence of time, Nutrition I want to move into some- is- no, nutrition oh, no. research is tough for, for some of those very reasons. Yeah, totally, man. It's, I mean, it's okay. So, um, I've sort of done a, a bit of a 180 on, I don't want to say necessarily on fatty liver. My stance on fatty liver is still the way it is. Fatty liver is bad. Uh, you know, I used to be, we touched on this in our last interview, so I don't want to like go over stuff we've already talked about, but we can recap on it a little bit. You know, I was a firm believer that fructose was the problem, right? I really thought it was until I started understanding and you were one of the people that actually politely brought it up to me uh, a while ago. I can't even remember where it was, but it was something where, you know, if you look at it data for data, like saturated fat is bad too, if not even worse for fatty liver. And, you know, we can get nuancy with what percentage point it's worse or better or whatever. But if you had to say the effect on a fatty liver specifically, is saturated fat, in your opinion, worse than excess fructose, if you were eating same amounts of calories, same amount of calories of saturated fat versus same amount of calories of fructose? Yeah. I mean, so we only have a few studies on this, but they they tend to be pretty consistent that saturated fat in terms of an individual nutrient. And again, you've even got different sources of saturated fats that aren't created equal. Yeah. So I'm, I'm using a very broad brush. But saturated fat in general tends to be one of the more metabolically unhealthy um nutrients for you, especially when you look at liver fat. Um, so there was a, a study where they did overfeeding of either, I think fructose, glucose, or saturated fat. And what they found was both fructose, all three treatments increased liver fat. So I want to be clear on this. So when you overfeed, right, you consume more calories than you're expending, it's normal to have an increase in uh, visceral fat. But the group getting the saturated fat um, had a 70% greater increase in visceral fat compared to fructose. So that's kind of one of the things I kind of go back to is like, all right, well, you know, a lot of these people who are bringing their hands about fructose, well, I hope you're also worried about saturated fat, right? Because, you know, that's, that, that's a, a far more uh, impactful effect on the liver. Now, I think the data is pretty clear now. And, you know, I'm sure you could get a crazy amount of fructose where maybe something weird starts happening. But I mean, they even did a randomized control trial where they had um, men overeat 150 grams of fructose a day or sorry, not overeat. But they they basically gave men 150 grams of fructose, pure fructose to eat per day, which, by the way, good luck getting that from like fruit or I mean, even like soda, you'd have to have. I mean, it's possible you'd have to have about seven, eight cans of soda a day to get that amount of fructose. So it's possible. Uh, but obviously, like that's coming with a lot of calories as well, and that's going to cause problems. But um, in this study, um, they didn't add any body fat. Apparently, they, interesting, it seemed like the fructose had kind of a, a, satiating, a satiating effect. Um, so they kind of compensated by lowering their other, um, their other calorie, sources of calories. And they didn't see any differences in liver fat. They didn't see any differences in really any like metabolic marker they looked at. Um, so that seems to suggest that it's more about like if you overfeed, you tend to put on body fat. And part of that body fat is the visceral adipose tissue. Um, that seems to be the worst for, as you said, saturated fat and also like, you know, obviously alcoholism. Like if you yeah. have a lot of 
alcohol. Like you don't need to add weight to add uh, visceral fat. So you- now I want to be really clear. I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm just picking on saturated fat because again, overfeeding of any form will increase uh, liver fat. But when we look at fructose and there was a really nice, um, I think it was an umbrella review or a systematic review uh, looking at basically exchanging any sort of non-fructose carbohydrate for fructose and what happened with liver fat. And basically they show that nothing happens, mm-hmm. that, that essentially it's a calorie thing, that, that it's, just over, it's just overfeeding. That If you look at studies where they don't control calories or they don't do any kind of exchange, yes, people who eat more fructose have greater levels of liver fat, but that's where they're getting the fructose. They're getting the fructose from, you know, soda or, or whatever. So, um, and even the studies on soda, which is like the worst thing for you, just from the perspective that, you know, if you drink soda, it's not like you go, okay, well, that was 40 grams of sugar. So now I'm not going to have that pasta tonight. Like that's not what people do. They just drink that on top of their normal diet. Um, but even studies in soda where they take sugar sweetened beverages and exchange them for other forms of carbohydrate, they don't see an effect on liver fat when they control calories. So it really does appear to be mostly a calorie effect. Interesting. Yeah, because that was going to be my next question. If someone is eating a ridiculous amount of fructose and let's just, you know, purely hypothetical situation, someone's eating just a ridiculous amount of fructose, yet they're still in a deficit, is that essentially going to offset how much they store as sheer liver fat, or is it just going to offset how much they store in the way of liver fat and body fat? And that ratio is probably to be determined upon the individual. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know. I, I really don't like trying to speculate when yeah, I've never sure, done the sure. experiment, but I, I, feel, I feel pretty confident that if you were, if somebody was in a deficit, but eating a lot of fructose, I don't think you'd see an increase in liver fat. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that, you know, if that was the case, especially in that study where they overfed or not overfed, but when they supplemented men with 150 grams of fructose a day and they were eating at maintenance calories, I mean, especially then, I mean, that's a lot of fructose and that's on top of like any fructose they're getting throughout their diet. So my guess is they might've been approaching 200 grams of fructose a day and they just didn't see any increases in liver fat. So my suspicion would be, you know, if you're eating a lot of fructose, but you're in a deficit, I don't think you're going to see increases in liver fat. In fact, I think you probably see decreases in liver fat if you're in a deficit. Yeah, I would probably agree. And a year ago, I probably would have disagreed. And it's, I would argue it's probably the same with That's saturated. a beautiful thing, man. Yeah, it's, That's I'm, a beautiful thing. <laughs> it's, and it's interesting. I mean, and I would argue the same with saturated fat, right? I, I, I mean, as much as saturated fat maybe is a little bit different just because it's, it has some different processes involved, but at the same time, like, as someone that's preached intermittent fasting for so long because of all these different pathways and all these different things. And I still think intermittent fasting is great. Don't get me wrong. I still do it. I still love it. I still time-restricted feed, whatever. But one thing that it's taught me is that phosphorylating AMPK and putting yourself in a deficit and all these things that come along with that are very similar, if not the exact same things that are happening. So I could still say, like, if, if someone's saying intermittent fasting is potentially reducing liver fat, it's probably because they're in a deficit. It's not because it's magic. Although it is magical for some people, I'll put it that way, because yeah, maybe it's the only thing that's worked for them. And I, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It's a hormetic stress, or I don't want to turn this into an intermittent fasting conversation. I just want to have clarity because I know my audience is going to be concerned, right? It's still a hormetic <laughs> stressor, still has benefits that perhaps are different from body composition as a, you know, a sheer hormetic stressor and whatever benefits you want to, you know, stack up for that. But it brings me into really just the meat of this discussion that I really want to talk to you about because I've seen you do some stuff on this. And I recently put out a video that I got a lot of shit about because I came out and was saying, hey, guys, like people that are doing keto, people that be careful what you wish for, because if you start eating, you know, 200 grams of saturated fat per day, there are pretty clear indicators, very clear indicators if you look in vitro. But I know you probably have even more evidence than I have that saturated fat can absolutely trigger insulin resistance. I shouldn't say absolutely, right? We know not to say that, right? But it looks pretty strongly that saturated fat can also cause insulin resistance. I caught 
because people thought that I was saying never eat saturated fat. And they're saying, Thomas, you're completely doing a 180 from what you said three years ago. No, I made it very clear. I'm saying again, I made it very clear in that video that I personally feel like maybe 20% of your fat calories should come from saturated fat. Maybe somewhere in there's a good number. That's a healthy number. Um, but maybe you can describe this more and I'll explain what I know uh, or what I've learned recently. And it has to do, seems to do with beta cells and basically fuel availability. When the beta cell is getting enough fuel from lipids, from fat, it does not need the fuel stimulation from glucose. So by contrast, it doesn't really respond to glucose the way that it should, should, because the fat has already provided it with enough fuel, ATP, for its secretion of insulin. Am I incorrect? Is that a pretty, is it, does that make sense? So I've got a study pulled up right now. So I, I, I kind of take it from, you're kind of taking it from the mechanistic perspective and I kind of take totally. it from a little bit more of a, of a, of a 10,000 foot approach, I guess the best way of describing it. Which is it, right? the better way to do it, candidly. Yeah. Well, it just, it just depends. There's, there's benefits to both. But, um, you know, to me, again, nutrition research can be very messy. Um, so what I look at is I really... You know, if there's some disagreement between studies or we don't have a whole lot of studies, I really look at, okay, what are the, if we look at the most tightly controlled human randomized control trials, like what, are, what do they tend to show, right? So there was a, a study that was done, um, I'm just going to, let me see the title here. A high fat, high saturated diet increases, sorry, decreases insulin sensitivity without changing intra-abdominal fat in weight, stable, overweight, and obese adults. So basically in this study, they either... Um, it probably was a slightly overfed population. So the, the calorie intake was about 3,300 calories in the low fat diet and in the, um, the high fat diet. And um, the percentage of, of fat in the high fat diet was 55% and the percentage of fat in the low fat diet was 20%. So a pretty big difference and a threefold difference in saturated fat. But again, these people are weight stable. So I guess it wasn't overfed. Um, I guess it makes sense. They're obese, so they've got higher levels of energy expenditure, so they're eating 3,200 calories a day. Um, and the difference in the fats, the um, the saturated fat was three times greater. MUFAs, or monounsaturated fats, were actually uh, greater in the high-fat diet as well. And PUFAs were a little bit higher in the high fat diet, which makes sense because they're getting, you know, two and a half times more total fat. Yeah. Um, but as a percentage, obviously the saturated fat is quite high. And so they had them do this, I think it was 12 weeks and they looked at like liver fat and like these different markers and they used a euglycemic clamp for measuring insulin sensitivity, which is really considered the gold standard. A lot of people like to put the stamp on HOMA IR, but if you talk to a lot of Nutritional biochemists, they'll kind of tell you like the euglycemic clamp really is the gold standard for measuring insulin sensitivity. So even in people who were weight stable um, and who didn't have an increase in fat mass, they saw a decrease in insulin sensitivity from a high saturated fat diet. Now, is it the saturated fat or is it the high fat, right? Like this is one of the difficulties to tease it apart. It would be great if they just did like both diets completely the same and then varied the saturated fat to see. But again, this is why nutrition science is messy because it's hard to get funding. And so you usually try to do two experiments in one, right? Yeah. So my feeling is for this, this kind of stuff when it comes to saturated fat, I can't really find a good reason to consume a high saturated fat diet, right? Like a lot of people will say, well, look at these, um, like Paul Saldino does this. He's like, well, look at these uh, disease states where LDL cholesterol is low. That means you need more LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is involved in the immune system. The amount of LDL cholesterol you need is so low to get, to get like the immune system benefits or to, to, to do what's needed to be done, then you could virtually consume almost no saturated fat and have more than enough LDL cholesterol to do what it needs to do. Like, and honestly, good luck trying to avoid saturated fat. Like it's, it's very difficult to avoid completely. And when you look at the, so I guess I should give my background on this because this is something I've changed my mind on Thomas. 
So when I first got into graduate school in 2004, the prevailing uh, feeling, not feeling, sorry, the prevailing kind of wisdom was, well, we were probably wrong about saturated fat. And it looks like it's not the LDL cholesterol. It's actually your HDL to LDL ratio is the most important thing. But then we had quite a few uh, randomized control trials come out where they give drugs that raise L HDL and they didn't have an effect on really any um, disease outcome. So it didn't, it didn't decrease the rates of heart attack, um, those sorts of things. So you need to think about HDL. HDL is kind of more of a marker of metabolic health. So if you're in good shape, you'll usually have good HDL levels. Um, it plays more of a passive role. Whereas LDL, like we know mechanistically it penetrates the endothelium. So we know it can do that. We know if you feed higher levels of LDL in lab rats or lab animals that you, we see an accumulation of um, like the, the cholesterol in the endothelium. And... To me, what really changed the game and changed my mind on saturated fat, because I was very slow to change my mind on this, uh, even back like as late as probably 2017, I would say things like, well, I think saturated fat's been unfairly demonized and um, it's not something I'm really worried about. I'm really worried about it as long as somebody's, you know, not over consuming calories. When I started looking at the uh, Mendelian randomized uh, control trials, that's what really changed my mind. So for people who aren't familiar Mendelian randomization, basically, I'm going to really, really, really abbreviate this, but basically it works as a randomized control trial based on genetic polymorphisms. So we know that based off certain genetic polymorphisms, some people secrete more LDL and some people naturally secrete less LDL. Well, you can follow those people and stratify them into their levels of LDL secretion and then look at their incidence of disease over time. And it is like a very pronounced linear effect of LDL cholesterol on heart disease risk. Like it is, I mean, it honestly was very striking the first time I saw these studies. And so, you know, the other thing to look at, if you look at like kind of going back to the Framingham study, like one of the biggest studies we have of heart disease. A lot of people make a big deal about inflammation. A lot of people make a big deal about HDL. Maybe those things make a difference. But if you look at both the highest levels of LDL, or sorry, highest levels of HDL and lowest levels of HDL, at both those levels, if you then stratify into people high HDL or low LDL or high LDL, regardless of their HDL level, the higher levels of LDL all had increased heart attack risk. Hmm. And that was true for high LDL and at low, or sorry, that was true at high HDL and at low HDL. Now, at high HDL, their absolute risk was lower than it was when they were low HDL. But still, again, when you're looking at LDL in that stratification, the high LDL level still had higher risk. Same That's thing so for inflammation. Yeah. So the same thing for inflammation. If you had low inflammation, your absolute risk was lower if all things were equal with everything else. But if you had low inflammation high LDL versus low inflammation, low LDL, low inflammation, low LDL still had a lower disease rest than low inflammation, high LDL. So that so is really a great example of independent uh, disease risk. Like that, that, that truly is an independent marker of disease risk. And I mean, people still to this day will, you know, say that saturated fat is completely healthy and you shouldn't worry about your LDL cholesterol. And kind of what I say is, I'm just not sure what level of evidence you need in order to decide to change your mind on this. Because again, I was very much in the camp of it doesn't, saturated fat doesn't matter. LDL cholesterol doesn't matter as much as HDL versus LDL. And then I saw enough evidence that I'm like, okay, I can't defend this position anymore. Yeah. And I changed my mind on it. You know, and I, again, I'm not saying totally. somebody who, you know, like I'm not, I'm not saying that you should never have saturated fat. And for some of you, if a high saturated fat diet is the easiest thing for you to stick to and control your calories, then maybe it is better than another diet that's low in saturated fat.
But you have to understand that while it might be the best diet for you in your particular circumstance, it is not as good at reducing disease risk if you, as if you were able to get into that deficit at a lower saturated fat level. No, so I, again, I agree. These things yeah. are all about trade-offs. Well, and with with keto, I've always been a proponent of doing keto from a Mediterranean standpoint. Like I always say, like if you're going to do keto, Spider Man with great power comes great responsibility. The the way that I'm <laughs> going to tell you to do keto is probably not going to be the sexiest way that you want to do keto. I hate to break it to you, right? Like I'm going to. And again, I had Paul Saladino on, on my on my channel. I'm, I'm, I mean, it's interesting hearing different sides. He doesn't agree with me. The reason that he hit me up and said, I want to come on your channel is specifically because he saw my saturated fat video. And I'm always down to have an interesting conversation. And the fact of the matter is I still stand behind based upon the observational research. I think if you're going to do keto, a more Mediterranean approach with probably less than 20% of your calories coming from saturated or fat calories coming from saturated fat, it's probably wise. Can I say with 100% certainty? 100% not, I can't. But I can tell you based upon what I see, that's probably the best way. And with keto, I, I keep coming back to this, it's of exceptional concern because as a percentage and gram for gram, you're consuming copious more fats, amounts of more fats, right? So the amount of actual, like if I tell you to eat 20% of your fat calories from saturated fat to someone on the standard American diet, it's going to be less saturated fat than if I tell someone that's doing a eucaloric ketogenic diet to eat 20% of your calories and saturated fat. So I say with great power comes great responsibility because you're going to be eating all these fats. It is your job to make sure that you're not overdoing the saturated fats. I get flamed all the time for that. And I've taken that stance for years. I've just become more outspoken about that particular piece recently. Um, I don't know. I just yeah. think it's it's important for people to understand that. And I think a lot of people don't understand the concept of lifetime disease risk. Like people say, well, you know, such and such did this and they lived to be 90. Okay, well, people smoke every day and live to be 90 as well. Like, that doesn't really prove yep. anything. Again, we're talking about risk. Risk doesn't mean that something will absolutely happen. It just means that you are increasing your risk. For example, if it is lightning outside and I stay inside, I am relatively low risk of being struck by lightning. Is it possible I still could be? Uh, I mean, maybe, but it's pretty darn low near zero, right? Yep. If I step out on my balcony, that risk goes from near zero to non-zero, right? Yep. Like probably a little bit harder because it's a narrow you know, area, whatever. Now, if I step out into an open field with no trees around me, I've increased it even more. And now if I stand in the middle of a, on a hill with no trees and I'm holding a 10 foot metal pole, now I'm really increasing that risk, right? Yeah. Now that doesn't mean I'm going to 100% get struck by lightning. I probably still have a relatively low risk of getting struck by lightning. But do you really want to play around with it, right? Like that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the, the point is you have to understand risk. And I think one of the things that people really misunderstand, and, and Paul really likes to point out like the Minnesota uh, coronary uh, study. That's that's one he really hangs his hat on. Um and I think, so this study was done over a five-year period, and it was with one of the, the elegant parts of the design is it was an inpatient study. So they were actually controlling the food they were giving to people. And uh, they, were, they were doing either high polyunsaturated, low saturated fat, or high saturated fat, low polyunsaturated fat. And they didn't, I mean, the, the end thing is they don't really see any, they didn't really see any differences. Um, he'll point out a subset of data and say, well, look, they actually had higher mortality rates in the low saturated fat group. That data wasn't significant and um, it's really a subsection of the data. But somebody might say, well, Lane, if saturated fat really is that bad, why wasn't there a difference between these groups? And that's a great question. So let me put it to you this way. Thomas, if you and I, and I like to use a financial example, right? If we put, at our age now, we put five grand into two different accounts. You put yours in a, a retirement account that gets you 8% and mine goes in a retirement account that gets me 7%, right? If we look at it after a couple of years, you'll have a little bit more money, but it probably won't be a significant difference, right? Like if we tested it with uh, statistics. But if we looked in 40 years, we're talking about probably tens of thousands of dollars of difference due to compounding interest, right? Yep. 
So part of the problem with the study is a randomized controlled trial of which the average duration that people were in this trial, even though the trial was five years, the average duration was two years. And these people were mostly in their 40s. Well, good luck getting a lot of incidences of heart attacks uh, in two years in people in their 40s. Like this stuff takes time to develop. You know, like even, you know, Paul likes to point out that he's got a, a, a calcium score of zero. Great. Right now. <laughs> it may not be that way in 30 years. And again, I'm not like, I don't want to sound like I'm like wishing for that to change. I don't. I hope he stays to be, lives a ripe old age and be, is a healthy human being. Um, but, you know, just using those as kind of examples, that's why I'm so drawn to the Mendelian randomization trials because they're a lifetime, looking at a lifetime of exposure. And it really, truly is a lifetime of exposure, which is also why in the statin trials that are only a few years long, a lot of times you don't really see big differences in risk reduction. But if you get people on a statin early and the trial is long enough, you do actually see a significant reduction in risk of heart disease. So again, unfortunately, th this is it's so easy to just pick out an individual study and kind of prop it up and say, see here. And that's why it's really important to look at the consensus of the data. And once again, I tell people, I'm like, all right, if you think that seed oils are the, are the problems that cause everything, you must think that saturated fat is the devil because like saturated fat has all the data that seed oils have plus a bunch of extra stuff. So, yeah. um, a lot of this just boils down to dogmatism and, and people having a, a pre-existing belief and just wanting to validate that belief, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's it's been interesting to see Paul's stance change in a few things, obviously. Like his stance on insulin has has changed quite a bit, which I I applaud him for. I think it's I think it's interesting because I, I feel like um, you know, we have this discussion because he and I kind of share I feel like the fact that insulin allows fuel to get into a cell is such a small function of insulin, right? I shouldn't say small. Right. It's a huge function of insulin, but there's so much more going on, right? There's and a lot of downstream effects, yeah. A lot. And, you know, as far as – and it kind of gets us into this almost I, – I, I have learned to not really like longevity topics when I do them as content because it's Ooh. just like we don't know. Messy. <laughs> Yeah, and it's very messy, and you really poke buttons with people. Like I think, I think subconsciously, like just the the fear of dying and things like that. You really just so I actually reeled back. I was doing some, and then I was like, you know what? No, all these guys are kind of wackadoodles in a lot of ways, and I just don't even. And it, I just it, it's just you know what? I'm going to stay in my lane a little bit more. But the one part that is very interesting that it dovetails from insulin, and I don't want to like come away from this discussion on saturated fat because I think it's so big, but at the same time. I guess the insulin piece kind of dovetails into it. The side of protein and touching on longevity for just a little bit, protein is like strongly your wheelhouse, obviously. Um, there's this caveat in the longevity world and discussion. Protein, muscle mass, obviously very, very important metabolically for glucose sink, uh, just staving off insulin resistance, which I have mixed feelings on insulin resistance too, right? Because I also kind of feel like insulin resistance might kind of be coming into play to actually protect us from nutrient overload, like too much, right? It's like, maybe it's happening for a reason, hypothetically, right? I, I don't know. Like, could it be it's stopping fuel from getting in because the cell doesn't need fuel at that time? Maybe it's doing us a service, not in a pathological sense, but in a you know physiological sense. Anyhow, I digress with just the longevity piece. Where is this balance? Because so much data is coming out and I don't know if it has a plant-based skew to it or not, but so much data saying, okay, restrict protein for longevity. Very interesting stuff. Um, you know, methionine restriction specifically, but then you have just that other side where it's like, if you're frail and weak, then that's not exactly good metabolically for longevity or from taking a fall or a spill. Like, what's kind of your, your stance on this? And maybe we can get more granular on it. So my first stance is the reason and the, the justification for not consuming high protein typically boils down to something like this. Well, protein stimulates mTOR, and we know mTOR is bad for longevity. So my pushback on that would be, sorry, my cat is trying to jump up in my lap <laughs> right now. Um, so my pushback on that would be, 
I can make any nutrient seem anti-longevity if I just look at its acute effects. Carbohydrates increase insulin. That's bad for longevity. That act, insulin activates mTOR. Okay. Yep. All right. That's bad for longevity. It activates all these different kinases that are, you know, anti-longevity. Well, what about fats? Well, fats can decrease flow-mediated dilation. That's bad for heart mm-hmm. disease. So I can I can take a mechanism and I can scare you with it for probably almost anything. And I can even do that with vegetables. Like Paul Saldino does that with vegetables. He's like, hey, there's this toxin in broccoli. And it's like, yeah, and about 10,000 times less the dose that it would need to be toxic. <laughs> yeah. But uh, again, you can pick an isolated thing and make it seem scary through its acute effects. But the bigger question is, what does the broad data say? And unfortunately, with longevity, you know, you're not going to have a randomized control trial on longevity in humans. It's just not going yeah. to happen, right? So what do we see? Well, we see that people live pretty long, different areas of the world, eating very different diets. But the commonalities seem to be they're not over-consuming calories. They're pretty active. Pardon me. And uh, I mean, that's that's a lot of it. That is a, yeah. a big portion of it. And here's some of the really big problems with the animal research. So all of my research was in, in rodents. So I'm not going to sit here and say that rodent research is not useful. But there are specific models that make a lot more sense for specific questions. I don't think the rodent model makes a whole lot of sense for longevity. And here's why. People plateau in weight or or mass, typically um, the obesity epidemic notwithstanding, but the, you know, over the course of history, people plateaued in their mass around like their twenties or thirties. And that was pretty much it. And then, uh, you know, once they hit their sixties and seventies, they start to fall off. Animal or rodents will continue to grow and they don't really stop growing. They just kind of slow down and plateau near the end, but it's a very different growth curve than what humans incur. And if we look at the research in primates, um, you know, Here's the other portion of it. They call it caloric restriction. Here's the facts. If it was calorie restriction, truly, they would die. Like at a certain point, if you're always calorically restricted, you die. (laughs) So what they're really saying is when they say 30% caloric restriction, what they're really saying is we looked at how much these animals normally eat and we cut it down by 30%. I know because I've done that in a study with, with uh, lab rats and they still grew at the amount we were feeding them. They were technically calorically restricted, but they still grew. They just grew more slowly than they usually would. And in the case of like primates, typically what you see with Sorry, my mic just went out for a second. Typically what you see in primates is you may have, if they start them calorically restricting them when they're adults or juveniles even, you'll see a little bit of weight loss and then it just plateaus, right? Because at a certain point, their expenditure has to adjust to meet the decreased energy. Otherwise, they die. So what that says to me is not that caloric restriction or fasting or anything like that is, that is great for longevity. It just says you're not letting them overeat. You're maintaining them weight stable throughout the course of adulthood. And that appears to be healthy. So my take on longevity is probably a lot different than a lot of people. And people go into the methionine restriction. All, good luck just trying to restrict methionine out of your diet. I mean, good luck. I don't even know <laughs> yeah. what that – like. I, like no I, muscle meat. So un- yeah. 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 I, it's so unphysiological. I don't even know what to make. It's like when people come out with a model where they knock out like three different genes, they feed a lot of one nutrient and then something weird happens. And I go, Oh wow. Really? You were surprised by that, that you knocked out three genes and overfed a crap load of something and something weird happened. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm not really sure what that means for us old humans, but um, I guess it's, <laughs> you know, cool. I suppose. So, 
you know, when it comes to these models, I really do kind of lean on the primate literature a lot more than the rodent literature, just because their growth curve matches us a little bit more. And really, like, what I've seen is not super compelling for protein restriction. And again, like, I kind of go back to, all right, well, you're worried about mTOR. Resistance training activates mTOR a heck of a lot more than protein does, and for a much longer duration. So where are all these people getting sarcomas from resistance training? Oh, it's not happening. Probably because this stuff is a lot more complicated than just one pathway, right? Yeah. So I think I tend to take more broad strokes when it comes to longevity. I mean, again, maybe we'll be able to parse out more of this stuff as time continues. I, ha I think I have like six tenets I kind of like tell people to live a long life. And again, you have to understand some people are born with a time bomb inside them, whether it's like some sort of genetic polymorphism. They have the BRCA gene, which basically means you will get breast cancer at some point if you're a woman. Um, you know, some people have polymorphisms that like they are going to get prostate cancer. Like there's just not much you can do about it. So understand that. Again, we're talking about risk. OK. Don't eat like it. And I say that just because it sounds funny. <laughs> but meaning just don't overconsume calories for long periods of time. Uh, exercise regularly and vigorously. Get enough sleep. Limit alcohol, tobacco, drugs, all that kind of stuff. And limit your stress. And if you do those five things, you'll be better off than 99% of people. Because those are the big bricks. But unfortunately, they're not. They're, it's not as sexy as telling somebody, well, if you fast 16 hours a day, you can... Active, you can decrease mTOR and activate AMP kinase. And in this study, in this rodent with a overactive AMP kinase and a knocked out mTOR, they live to be a thousand. And it's like, okay, I, yeah, I just don't know what any of that really means for us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you're speaking kind of on the protein piece. I had a question that you're the right person to ask that I think a lot of people watching would get some benefit out of too. Um, okay. It's a two part question. One, protein overfeeding. Does it stores, doesn't store, does it, or does it not store as fat easier than other ones? That's part one. But then part two of that is at what point do EAAs maybe come into the equation as a signal for muscle growth versus fat gain, or is that training load dependent, dependent? And where do you draw the line there? Right? Like it's uh, to me like the, the ratio or the, the muscle protein breakdown versus muscle protein synthesis is just very difficult to determine, but if not impossible, really, like it's just a very mind-boggling question. It's like, where is that line, right? Because muscle protein synthesis is ultimately stimulated by EAA availability, right? That's kind of like turning on the ability to, hey, let's go ahead and start building some muscle. But if you're in a deficit, does that still happen? And like, it's a bunch of spin-off questions that come from that. And I know this is definitely your wheelhouse. Yeah. So they have shown that in a, uh, under conditions of caloric restriction, um, that it does reduce your basal rates of muscle protein synthesis. Um, and it does, it may decrease your meal fed rates of protein synthesis, but that's, it's difficult to measure for a whole host of different reasons. Um, the, the idea of protein being stored as fat is an interesting question. There's been a lot of debate about this. And so I'll give you two answers. The first is, can you store protein as fat? So the, the amino acids that get broken down out of your food that you eat, do those wind up in adipose tissue if you're overeating protein? The answer is probably not to an appreciable degree, probably much less than carbohydrate. Well, great. Well, that means that we should just overeat a ton of protein. Well, energy balance still does matter. If you overfeed protein, uh, you have to get rid of it somehow. Okay, so you're going to deaminate it, meaning it's going to, you know, exit your body as urea, the nitrogen component that is. And then now you have the carbon skeleton, which either needs to be turned into a ketone or a carbohydrate. So, I mean, I suppose, you know, it could be turned into glucose and then that glucose could go through de novo lipogenesis and wind up in adipose tissue. But that's a really long journey for a molecule to get there. Probably does happen, but probably not to an appreciable degree. What is more likely is those substrates, those carbon skeletons, which can enter the Krebs cycle, which uh, are anaplerotic, we call it, um, 
are going to spare the fats you consume, much like carbohydrate does, to be stored in adipose. So if you're overeating calories from protein, I think it's still likely you could store excess, cal- you know, that excess intake as body fat. But it's likely not going to come from the actual like amino acids being somehow put into adipose tissue. So the answer is both yes and no. <laughs> Got it. So it's kind of reprioritizing the fuel in a way. So it's almost yeah, yeah it's deaminated and then that's going to then put glucose to the front of the line or something like, you know, that yeah, could also Yeah, you just take like glutamate, right? Like, so if you take glutamate, you deaminate it, goes to alpha ketoglutarate, that now enters the Krebs cycle. Yeah. Well, what happens if you're entering the Krebs cycle? Well, that means that nutrients that would come from either fat or carbohydrate yep. are now having to wait to enter the Krebs cycle as this, you know, as you're cycling through that, you know, alpha ketoglutarate. Like I'm, I'm getting very like right yeah. here, but nope, I got that's you. kind of yeah. the, the story. Um, now, some people will say, well, look at these studies where they overfeed protein um, and they don't see an increase in fat mass, even though they're overfeeding calories. So the first thing is protein does increase your thermic effect of food. Um, so that's possible that you're expending a few more calories, you know, a few hundred, like a hundred more calories per day by eating a really high protein diet. But I also, again, when it comes to this stuff, I defer to like the most tightly controlled studies. So there's a couple of studies from Antonio and I like Jose, um, but these were free living studies. And I think what's very likely is people were actually over-reporting their calorie intake because they felt so satiated from eating so much protein, right? Or they were saying they were eating that much protein and weren't quite getting there because, I mean, he had a study, I think, where they were having like, I want to say like almost two grams per pound of body weight. Like that's a ton of yeah. protein. Um, so there's that. But if we look at, there was a study by Bray. Um, he's done some of the classic overfeeding studies. And this is a metabolic ward study. So they were, they are getting what they say they're getting right? And they're measuring all these different things. Well, they did not see a difference. Um, The calories were equated and they had groups, I think it was like 5% protein, 15% protein, and 25% protein. And the 25% protein group stored uh, the same amount of fat in adipose as the 5% and 15%. Now, the difference was they also stored more lean body mass. So that's a benefit right there. But I'm not sure I quite buy the argument that excess dietary protein is not going to increase fat mass because, yeah. again, it's just going to act as kind of a, a surplus to spare other nutrients yeah. to be stored in adipose tissue. Yeah. That's interesting. So with someone that's – okay, if someone is in a deficit because they're, say, cutting or anything like do they need to increase their protein requirements at that rate? So I guess it depends on where their protein is at currently, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that's a good But question. I would say that a, a deficit will, I don't want to say increase protein needs, but it'll increase the amount of protein that's required to maximize the benefits. Got it. So there was a good systematic review done by Eric Helms probably like five years ago uh, where they looked at like what protein, what amount of protein in a deficit might be useful for maintaining lean body mass. It was like 2.4 to 3 grams per kilogram of lean mass. So a little bit higher than the recommendations out there because the recommendations for building muscle at maintenance or in a surplus are 1.6 to 2.4 grams per kilo of body mass. So that's where it gets a little bit difficult. So those numbers sound like they're far apart, but they're actually probably not that far apart. Yeah. Because when you figure like the differences in lean mass versus absolute mass, I mean, again, like if somebody has a lot of fat mass, things get wonky. But for the most part, I would say, you know, if you're worried about it, when you go into a deficit, increase your protein by 10, 20 percent and you'll be fine. That's good. Okay. And, and last question on the protein thing. So based upon this, it may sound like a very elementary question, but I think it has some deeper stuff to it. So at that rate, with that being said, do plant proteins versus animal proteins really matter as far as stimulating the, you know, the protein synthesis that's occurring at that rate, right? If, 
from a longevity piece, and I know this just because I've been recently reading some of these protein restriction things and kind of shaking my head, but still reading them and kind of doing, some, trying to do some content that helps people understand, okay, if you're intermittent fasting, like here's things you might need to pay attention to as main takeaway, increase your protein when you're intermittent fasting, right? But with that, there brings the nuanced discussion of, okay, well, does it make a difference if there are not huge amounts of leucine in the protein that they're consuming? Like, where does that come into play? Yeah, this argument gets sticky because people get really kind of like in their positions. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll, I actually just did a video on, on, on plant protein. Um, I think if you're doing a plant-based diet, you can absolutely get enough protein to maximize anabolism, but you're going to require more protein than you would if you were consuming animal products. Yeah. Uh, one, because... Plant, plant protein is just less digestible. Um, it's bound up in the, a lot of it's bound up in the fibrous material of the plant, which makes it inaccessible to a lot of the digestive enzymes. Now you still get, I mean, depending on the plant source, you can still get like 50 to 80% of the protein, but that's a lot lower. Whereas most animal sources, you know, start at like, you know, 90% bioavailability and up. Yeah. So that's the first kind of downside to plant protein. Second downside is they tend to be lower in essential amino acids, lower in branching amino acids, and lower in leucine, which leucine is the amino acid responsible for um, kind of triggering muscle protein synthesis. And this is actually my wheelhouse, like you alluded to, Tom, because I did research studies on this where we compared different protein sources, same total protein intake, but just varied the protein source. And we saw differences in muscle protein synthesis based on like, so it was wheat, soy, egg, and whey, and both egg and whey were superior for increasing muscle protein synthesis compared to wheat and soy. That being said, in our studies where we got the absolute amount of protein high enough, like um, we did a, like th this study I'm referring to, we did like 15% of total calories from protein. So especially at the lower end of protein, the source makes a big difference. Yeah. But when we got to like 30% of calories from protein, we didn't see differences between like these plant sources, isolated plant sources of protein and the higher quality animal sources. Because once you get over that cap, that threshold, just adding more on top of it doesn't seem to do much. So the, the point is that if you're going to consume plant sources of protein, you're just going to need a little bit more and you're probably going to want to at least consume some sort of isolated protein source because it's going to be really difficult Especially if you're somebody who's in a deficit, like if you're, you know, dieting and you're trying to do it plant-based, you're going to get quite a few calories adding up from just the carbohydrate byproduct of what you're consuming for protein, then it's mm. going to be hard to maintain a deficit and also get sufficient amounts of protein to maximize anabolism or muscle retention uh, on that diet. And also, again, the issues with digestibility. So I do tell people... You know, if you are willing to have an isolated like plant protein source, like um, of the popular sources of plant protein, soy to a lesser extent, pea is probably your some of your best bets. Rice protein's okay. Um, you're probably going to have to combine a few different sources, so you're not you know um, deficient in some of these amino acids. The best plant source of protein is an isolated source I've seen is actually potato protein, which has all the amino acids in the right ratios and a high leucine content, it's just extremely hard to find. And it also yeah. tastes horrid. <laughs> so, um, you know, those are some of the limitations you're having with plant-based protein. But, you know, I'll never sit here and say that, you know, somebody can't be a good athlete or, um, you know, build a lot of muscle on a plant-based diet. You can, it just takes a little more planning and a little bit more attention to detail. No, totally. And do you think there's a place for essential amino acid supplementation for plant-based dieters at that rate given I can't remember I think there was uh I know there's been a couple of studies that kind of demonstrate that just you know supplemental EA is alongside protein consumption can improve muscle protein synthesis I don't know if they're how flushed out they are they seem pretty pretty meritable so I mean as someone that's doing a plant-based diet if they added some EAAs alongside it could it potentially help them yeah, that's another that's another um, potential benefit of essential amino acids. If you didn't want to do like an isolated source of protein, although I feel like all right, if you're going to do EAAs, yeah. you might as well do an isolated source of protein, I, right? Totally, hundred um, percent. Yeah, you know, it 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 would be a situation where certainly if you're having a plant based meal, you add essential amino acids to it, 
um, <clears throat> that would increase the quality of the meal, hundred percent. I mean, we did this in um, in my research. So we we took um, wait, kind of just like as a last. There's a deeper story behind this, but kind of as a last sort of proof that it was in fact leucine that was causing these downstream effects on muscle protein synthesis. We took our highest quality protein source away, and we took wheat, our the lowest performing protein source in our studies, and we just added leucine free leucine to the wheat source to make it match the whey. And wouldn't you know it, we got the exact same amount of protein hmm. synthesis out of the two. So that, that does point to, you could do exactly what you're saying. You could add some essential amino acids, some branched amino acids or some leucine, that sort of thing, and increase the quality of your plant protein meal. So that's also another option, yeah. like you said. Interesting. Yeah. I've, I've, I've used that sort of as a, a tip for people that are uh, plant-based people that are intermittent fasting and when they have a shorter eating window and maybe they can't get enough protein. So, well, okay. I mean, one thing that you could maybe do to increase the quality of your protein, especially when you have a compressed eating window and you're concerned with not getting enough protein is do that. And I want to make sure I wasn't kind of steering people wrong on that because it seemed, seemed fairly logical, but I'm not a plant-based eater. So I don't study that extensively, but I try to provide some content so I can at least help people in that category. But well, cool, man. This is this has been awesome, man. This is really helpful, actionable stuff, and I'm I'm glad that we're able to uh, people off together and also help some people. Uh, it's <laughs> Sorry, you're way nicer than me. They'll they'll blame me. They'll blame me. No, I will say oh, for no, what it's great. I, L- no, I Lane is a great, different but... different person on YouTube than he is on Instagram. I know people. You know, I just just will say, yeah, you, you know, Instagram. You got to go for the punch. You got to go for the jugular. You got to be quick and snippy and somewhat combative and uh you know so i know that some people in the low carb community have feelings about lane but i will say if you stop and and listen to what he has to say especially in long form content you find that you probably realistically only disagree with maybe a few percent of the things that he has to say yeah i mean it'll be interesting because i'm going to that low carb conference i know you're going to be there so um (laughs) you know i think we're on a a panel together so that'll be interesting great yeah i mean like again i I tell people like hey i'm I'm always happy to reach across the aisle you know if people are are willing to have a conversation so i I mean i think that's great and um you know at the end of the day I, i think that you know i have definitely been abrasive and in some cases nasty and i've actually really tried to dial that back because you know i think when you're younger you kind of come from this perspective of well anybody who's you know, doing X must just be a bad person, right? Yeah. And then I think life punches you in the face a few times and then you, you kind of realize, ah, or at least hopefully if you're paying attention, you realize, ah, people are complicated and I think most people are trying to do the right thing. And sometimes we just screw it up and a lot of it has to do with our own ego and biases and those sorts of things. And I just, I really, like I've said to people, I'm like, listen, I'm not going to say I get everything right. I, I probably don't get everything right. But I really try to be honest about when I change my mind on something and say, hey, like a great example of that I sold a B, I, I used to sell BCA supplements. I was sponsored by a company that had BCA supplements. I recommended BCA supplements. And after enough evidence came out, I said, you know what? I don't really think it makes a difference for most people. So I have a new supplement company and I'm not selling a supplement with BCAs. And even though my PhD was literally BCAAs. <laughs> so I think, you yeah. know, if somebody's willing to have, to me, that's like the scientific humility. And I mean, you've shown that by adjusting your views. And I think that that's, you know, that's really admirable. And I, I wish there was more people who, who just were willing to say, you know what, I'm not sure. Or, no, I can't say for sure. You know, those sorts of yeah. things. Like that's, I think that would go a long way towards alleviating a lot of the anxiety that's out there with people and, and food insecurity, you know? Totally. Yeah, oh, I agree, man. And it's definitely like I was a little, a little cavalier with stuff when I was younger. And I think that just happens with people when they're younger anyway. Right. There's, and as time has gone for me, it's like, okay, I just want to, I'm just learning through this process too. Like, you know, I'm just wanting to grow and figure out what works for me. And as I grow and have a family, you know, it's, it's learning what's going to help me and my family live a long, healthy life and be happy. And uh, it's really difficult for both of us in our situation. You've you've turned some corners in different ways. I've turned corners in different ways. People see you in one way online, and I'm talking about your followers, not even necessarily your adversaries. 
My followers right. see me 2015, 16, and it's difficult for them to see growth and change because they want to see that they think that it's contradictory when it's the algorithms. I, I can blame it on the algorithms. That's one thing I can't blame it on. Is if every single person saw every video and saw the progression, it would make sense. But the hard part is someone will get served a video from 2016 and then get served a video from 2022. And I could just go back and delete that video from 2016, but there's also good pieces that are in there. And sorry, but it's also difficult, you know, to, you you can't break that whole algorithmic chain. It's different. It's anyway, you get it, right? I get so, it. <laughs> yep. I get it. But, no, and I think, you know, a lot of the, probably the change also is like, you're seeing some of the, the downstream effects to, you know, like um, information that may not be completely accurate or it's missing the nuance that it needs, right? Like, so for yeah. example, Oh, you know, somebody here as well, maybe fructose is bad for liver fat, so I'm not going to eat fruit. And it's like, no, that's actually like, no, <laughs> like that's fruit's good, like, like yeah. more fruit, right? But so I think that like, you know, uh, again, not to not to gush over you too, too, too much, but I, I think <laughs> that like it shows a lot of humility and um, just like really like self-awareness to say, oh, you know what? That's, that's, I was, I was not doing it the exact way that I think is the right way to do it. And I'm going to change the way I do it. And, you know, I think to be able to flip that switch says a lot. So like I said, like whenever you want to have me on or collaborate, I'm down, man, because yeah. I, I truly appreciate somebody who has the power to change their mind. Cause that's one of the hardest things to get a human being to do. Well, I think we, uh, we both have our, our wives to blame for uh, our humility, probably. <laughs> so, because <laughs> my wife has had a big play in that too, as I know you mentioned Holly has for you and it, it does come into play, right? Yep. It's just like, maybe you shouldn't be such <laughs> but, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure she's literally said that to me, so. <laughs> anyway, man, all right. Well, speaking of family, I got to hop off and I know you do too. So uh, yeah, man, as always, keep it locked in here on the channel and Lane, where can everyone find you? I mean, I'll, I'll link out down below, but. Yeah. So yeah, you can check out all my stuff. We got a nutrition coaching app. I think Thomas has talked about it before. Carbon Diet Coach. We've got workout programs on our website, biolane.com. I've got my supplement line out with nutrition. I just actually, Tom, something might be interesting for your viewers. I just um, started a research review, monthly research review called Reps. And that's available on my website as well, um, where we break down like five studies every single month that relate to fitness and nutrition and Make like without all the jargon, with all that stuff, just make it something super palatable for the average person to understand. And then we kind of summarize like what it actually means for you and your nutrition and how it fits with the rest of the evidence out there. I think it's something super useful for people and, and people will really love it. So uh, biolane.com is where you can find most of our stuff. And then on uh, social media, you can find me everywhere as biolane. Awesome, man. All right, y'all. All right. Thanks, Lane. Thanks, Tom. Have a great night, man. You too.